Welcome to our online worship from here in Dunkeld Cathedral, and thank you for joining us. Today, the service has gone live half an hour later than it normally would on the YouTube channel for the simple reason that we've started services in the cathedral for the first time since March the 15th, and that starts at 11 a.m., so I thought it would be a good idea to at least have some small sense of togetherness as we worship God. The Kirk Session took the decision to start services again, well aware that many people will not feel easy about coming back into a larger group, and also aware that we are limited to a maximum of 50 people, and that some don't relish the thought of coming back into the building where everyone is spaced out, round about, we also wear masks, and there's no singing. See, we preachers fondly imagine that people come to church for the stimulating sermons and the wonderful oratory. In reality, we like to sing, and we like to meet together, and both these things are restricted at the moment still by COVID. So given that many won't be joining us for a while at the, the real service, we're going to continue with the, the virtual service as well. Most weeks the theme will be the same, but today there's a difference because the cathedral service is going to be about coming back and coming back into the place to worship. Today we are looking at a story in Matthew chapter 20, and we can also do music in a way on, online, which we can't in the live setting yet. So we've got a wonderful song later on, sung by Karen, uh, Beauty for Brokenness, which will be part of our prayers for ourselves and the world towards the end of the service. So for those who are watching at home and those who come to the cathedral today for the first time in months, we are united in Christ, part of his body. And we long for the day when we can all meet again and sing his praise together in this house of prayer. Psalm 122 has the same longing. I rejoiced when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Now we are standing within your gates, Jerusalem. Jerusalem, a city built compactly and solidly. There the tribes went up, the tribes of the Lord. To give thanks to the name of the Lord, the duty laid on Israel. For there the thrones of justice were set, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you prosper. Peace be within your ramparts and prosperity in your palaces. For the sake of these, my brothers and my friends, I shall say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I shall pray for your well-being. Wherever you are in church or joining us remotely, we know, all of us, that we are safe in the shadow of the Lord. Hymn 55.
Please join me in prayer. Lord, your goodness to us has never failed. Your love never falters. Your faithfulness endures forever. Despite our falls and stumbles. For that we praise you and place our trust in you, creator, redeemer, constant companion. Our faith, by contrast, has ebbed and flowed. Our love has been selective, our patience lacking. We confess that many of us have become more stressed and anxious over these past months. Bombarded as we are by so much bad news, our faith is stretched. So coming to this place or praying on our own, we need to draw breath. And remember again that we are in the hands of our loving Heavenly Father who knows us and knows what disturbs us. Come, Lord, and give your peace beyond understanding. Then, Holy Spirit, replace all anxiety with joy as we worship. For you are with us, you promise it, and we believe it. You care for us in your eternal love. And we are so grateful that we can be at peace in you. So from the depths of our hearts, we cry Alleluia in praise to you, our Lord and Redeemer. The text today comes from that well-known Dundee theologian, Dennis the Menace, who hit the nail on the head in one of his cartoons. Dennis and his wee friend Joey are leaving Mrs Wilson's house, hands full of cookies, and, and Joey says, what have we done to deserve this? And Dennis replies, look Joey, Mrs Wilson gives us cookies not because we're nice, but because she's nice. There, in a nutshell, is the Gospel according to Dennis, because that goes to the heart of the parable we're going to hear in a moment of the workers in the vineyard. The real issue exposed here is not the workers' merit, but the master's generosity. And it depicts a scene that would be common in those days. Men needed work, and they would go to the marketplace in the hope of being taken on, but not all of them could be. But then as the harvest progressed and the, the fruit was hanging thick on the trees and maybe it looked like it was going to rain or there was too big a harvest, the master kept going back to the marketplace to take on more workers to get the fruit in, right up to the 11th hour. Now in those days it was a serious matter if a man didn't get a day's work. He wouldn't get paid and there was nothing to fall back on. So for the family it meant meagre rations that night. And not only that, but the wage they were given was not a king's ransom, just enough to cover their day's needs. So if you only got part of a day's work, then you're a worried wife at home and hungry children. But the twist in the tale comes at the end, when the pay is handed out. Those hired at the 11th hour get their pay first, and they get a full day's wage. So you can imagine those who had worked hard all day in the sun and, and picked a lot, they would be thinking, oh, we're going to get a great bonus. But no, they get the agreed day's wage as well. The same pay as those hired at the end. How might they react? How might any of us react? The story is in Matthew chapter 20. The kingdom of heaven is like this. There was once a landowner who went out early one morning to hire labourers for his vineyard. And after agreeing to pay them the usual day's wage, he sent them off to work. Three hours later, he went out again and saw some more men standing idle in the marketplace. 
Go and join the others in the vineyard, he said, and I will pay you a fair wage. So off they went. At midday, he went out again, and at three in the afternoon, and made the same arrangement as before. An hour before sunset, he went out and found another group standing there. So he said to them, Why are you standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they replied. So he told them, Go and join the others in the vineyard. When evening fell, the, own, the owner of the vineyard said to the overseer, Call the labourers and give them their pay, beginning with those who came last and ending with the first. Those who had started work an hour before sunset came forward and were paid the full day's wage. When it was the turn of the men who had come first, they expected something extra, but were paid the same as the others. As they took it, they grumbled at their employer. These late comers did only an hour's work. Yet you have treated them on a level with us, who have sweated the whole day long in the blazing sun. The owner turned to one of them and said, My friend, I am not being unfair to you. You agreed on the usual wage for the day, did you not? Take your pay and go home. I choose to give the last man the same as you. Surely I am free to do what I like with my own money. Why be jealous because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first last. Amen. This week, Gary Lineker, one of the highest paid people on TV, hit the headlines with his offer to take a pay cut of £400,000 this year. It's a very generous offer, in a way, although I don't know about you, but it's not one I could make. And if you take it against the backdrop of all the other earnings he will get, then in one year he'll earn more than most people earn in an entire career. So it stirred up the whole debate, the old debate about the earnings of people in the BBC, like 1.4 million to Zoe Ball and other comparable amounts. Mind you, it did make me think for a moment that doing all this recording stuff, maybe I should try renegotiating the stipend here, but I don't suppose I'd get very far with that one. But seriously, it raises a debate about reward and our ideas of just treatment and fairness, because we find it very hard to escape from the idea of a league table, um, a deserving, an earning of what we get in life. And the key verse in this parable has to be verse 15, where the master says, surely I am free to do what I like with my own money. Why be jealous? because I am generous. That takes us to the very heart of what it's about. On the one hand, it's telling us something about God's nature, but it also reveals something about the way we tick. So what about God's nature? Well, to paraphrase Dennis the Menace, the real issue is God's kindness, not ours. His generosity, not our deserving. Because it's all of grace and nothing is deserved. We come out with hands and hearts full, not because of our goodness, but because of God's. Is God fair? Well, no, he isn't. And thank goodness for that, because none of us gets treated in the way we deserve. We all get treated with grace and mercy, because if we weren't, we'd be in a sticky wicket. Go back to the issue of the wages for a minute in the parable. The, the pay was enough in one day for the needs of that day. No room for error. In other words, we could take that as representing the totality of our needs, i.e. salvation. God in his grace gives that freely to anyone who seeks, and you can't have more than that 
and you can't have part of salvation. You're either invited into the kingdom of heaven or you're not. So all comers get the totality of the amount needed. We all receive what we need and none of us gets treated fairly in that sense. So why grumble about God's generosity? Should we not be glad about it? Because this is about the compassion of God. And it's a surprise because in the words of Isaiah, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. Or the master here, surely I am free to do what I like with my own money, to be generous. Surely God is free to be generous as he sees fit. And God's justice is different from the way we think. We know that Jesus was often criticized in his earthly life for the company he kept. He didn't go to the righteous and the deserving and those who were full of merit in terms of society's thinking. He went to those who were outcasts and despised and felt forsaken. The very people who normally we would think merit condemnation. And Jesus went to them and declared God's grace and goodness. And through this parable, Jesus is saying, you may criticize me for that behavior, but I am this way because that's what God is like. That's the way God treats every one of us. contrast to the master's generosity where we are to learn something of God, the parable says something about the way all of us tick. Why be jealous because I am generous? This gives the game away on some typical human attitudes that we have, that despite the generosity of God, we just can't get over this idea of merit, that somehow we have to earn God's favor and some deserve merit more than others. We just don't seem to be able to leave behind this idea of justification by good works, that we earn our way into God's good books by being good. And we end up in the fiery place if we are bad. 
But that's to misunderstand the whole relationship that we have with God that Jesus spoke about and enabled us to have. Peter gives the game away just a few verses earlier before this parable where his words are recorded. What about us? We left everything to follow you. How shall we fare? Peter still thinks in terms of that worldly way of gaining merit by doing stuff. And some have done more than others to deserve more merit, so some are more equal than others. And Peter still thinks in terms of earning his way into God's favour. But the real motive for doing things has to be out of love, not so that we can get something back in return. And it seems to offend against natural justice for us. Surely those who are better, who do good, who do more, should get reward. But the owner of the vineyard gives the same to everybody in the end of the day, as long as they came along in the right spirit, wanting to work. So it's not dependent on what they had done or how long they had done it, but why they had done it. That's why grace is so amazing and why it still scandalizes people. Surely God is a judge who will reward the good and punish the bad. Surely that's the case. It just seems beyond belief that God is gracious and merciful, and still today people find that difficult to grasp. But the gospel is that we don't do anything to earn our way into God's favor. It's not dependent on our niceness, but on His. And when we realize that, then we begin to do things for the kingdom for the right motivation, not because we want something back in return, not because we think we will deserve a reward by doing it, but because we know we've already got it. And so we do whatever we do in love for him and in his service gladly. You know, in, in any human relationship, if you do things for a person with the hope of getting some payback at some point in the future, then you're motivated not by love, but by self-interest. So it is with God. We don't do good things to earn God's favor. We do good things because he's already declared that we are his. And so we can come in the right spirit. As Paul says, it's by grace that you are saved through faith. It is not your own doing, it's God's gift, not a reward for work done. So whether we are here all our lives, or for half our lives, or we come in at the very end of the day and seek mercy, the gift is there, just receive and take. And why do we begrudge God's generosity? But we do. We, we still have this attitude deep down that maybe we resent the newcomer. In the parable of the prodigal son, the older brother is aggrieved because the younger brother has gone away and he's spent all the money and squandered the inheritance, and he comes home tail between his legs and gets welcomed back in. And the older brother's annoyed, understandably in human terms. But this parable asks us to consider our feelings towards the latecomers. We like things the way they are, and we can easily give the impression to anyone new that yes, you're welcome, but you know, know your place. We are in charge, we'll do things the way we want, and don't you come in thinking that you've got equal rights with us. So we can be that way in our attitude to other folk. But sometimes too, we can be very hard on ourselves. Have you he ever heard it said things like, ah, there are as many good people outside the church as in? Or who do they think they are going to church, that they are somehow better? Or maybe it's not for the likes of me. I'm not good enough to be part of this or to come in. And statements like that just betray what lies deep inside us, that we still see it as a balance sheet as a competition, as a case of deserving or earning our way into God's good books by being good enough. And it's probably the most common misunderstanding of Christianity, of what it means to be a Christian. People think that somehow by doing that, you're declaring yourself to be good, to be morally superior. 
And, and the flip side of that is, if you don't feel good enough, or you're not up to the mark, or you've done something you feel bad about, then you, you won't fit in, you're not welcome, because you haven't met the standard. So we judge ourselves harshly. I've got no place here, I don't belong. But what Jesus said was, if you are tired, if you're burdened, if you're frayed around the edges, if you're a bit weary, you feel a bit rough, come and I will give you rest. He went out to the fringes to reach out to those who didn't fit, who didn't meet the mark, who didn't feel good enough that they might find forgiveness and healing. You are saved by grace. That, that's the gospel. Not because you deserve it, not because you've worked your way in, but because it's given. Dennis the Menace had it right. It's not because of our goodness that we leave here with hearts full. It's because of God's goodness to us. Sadly, I have to announce the death of a wonderful old lady, Jessie Sinclair, who died on Tuesday night at the amazing age of 110, making her the oldest person in Perthshire and very nearly the oldest person in Scotland. Jessie became something of a local celebrity here and was able to recount stories and details from a way back, from a time nobody else could remember with such a clear memory. She first came here as a young girl when her dad was the stonemason here in this building. And so had a long association and could speak of a life which nobody else had experienced. So we remember her family in our prayers as we give thanks for her. And the bulk of our prayers today will take the form of a lovely song, Beauty for Brokenness, which is a prayer for help and healing. Beauty for brokenness, hope for despair. Lord, in your suffering world, this is our prayer. Bread for the children, justice, joy, peace. Sunrise to sunset, your kingdom increase. Shelter for fragile lives, cures for their ills. Work for the craftsmen, trade for their skills. Land for the dispossessed, rights for the weak. Voices to plead the cause of those who can't speak. God of the poor, friend of the weak, give us compassion. We pray melt our cold hearts let tears fall like rain come change our love from a spark to a flame Refuge from cruel wars, havens from fear, cities for sanctuary, freedoms to share, peace to the killing fields, scorched earth to greet, Christ for the bitterness, his cross for the pain. Oh. 
Rest for the ravaged earth, oceans and streams Plundered and poisoned, our future, our dreams Lord and our madness, carelessness, greed Make us content with the things that we prayers of our hearts, Lord, are sometimes little more than longings, inexpressible yearnings reaching out to you for justice, mercy, compassion, kindness in this world where there is so much cruelty and hurt. And our prayers are too words of dedication, offering ourselves in your service. Whether we have been around church a long time or are just hovering on the edges. Draw us ever deeper into your love, for your grace is sufficient. Bless us. Bless all who are worried, weighed down. Bless the family of Jesse Sinclair with comfort and hope. Bless each one we think of now in Jesus' name. And so we pray in his words, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever. Amen. Thank you for joining us again in our online worship, and please join next week as well, if you can, at the same time of 11 o'clock. If you would like to come to a service here in the cathedral, then go to the cathedral website, and on the worship page you'll find the details of how to register, so that we can keep a note of people's contact details and control the numbers here to abide by the regulations set down by the government. But you'd be very welcome to do that if you'd like to come. 
So now the blessing. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.